While paleo diets have a lot going for them, they also have a number of issues and problems. The main problems refer simply to the fact that the paleo diet is too reactionary. Basically, Paleo takes a great principle and then follows it through to its extreme conclusion. This is the problem with a lot of diets and it can often lead to us eating impractical or even unhealthy diets in some cases. Because, at the end of the day, we are not cavemen. As much as you might wish otherwise, we do not live in caves and our environments and lifestyles are not the same as they were back then. A lot of this video series is going to be focused on helping you get back to that kind of lifestyle, but unless you're incredibly committed, you're not going to be living a 100% caveman lifestyle. And even if you did, the climate has changed and so has the environment. That's the point of evolution. We're constantly changing and constantly adapting. If you don't adapt as well, well, then you'll die. The dinosaurs learned that one. Not all of our innovations are bad. Some of them are very good, and some of them are just nice. Trying to avoid anything that is man-made just doesn't make any sense. We're going to examine vitamin tablets later and discuss how fruits and vegetables are better for you. It's true, they definitely are. But that doesn't mean that vitamin tablets are bad for you. It doesn't mean that you can never eat vitamins in this form. And when you're in a rush or when you're travelling, eating vitamins in that form is going to be much more practical. Likewise, you'll probably want the occasional chocolate bar. You're not a saint, or unless you are, in which case I apologise. And not eating any bread is very likely unnecessary. The same goes for milk. In fact, milk contains a tonne of good nutrition and is a fantastic way to get protein. The whole purpose of milk is to deliver crucial nutrients to young animals. This means that it's very nutrient-dense. It's also a great source of saturated fat, the good kind, which can help to increase testosterone levels and brain function, amongst other things. And testosterone is actually made from cholesterol. And there's also a problem with completely disregarding calories. Many paleo proponents say that they would like the paleo diet because they don't need to count calories. They say that different calories affect you differently and that avoiding processed foods is enough to lead to a sudden transformation in the body. This is true to some degree, but what's also true is that you can still get fat by eating a nutrient-dense diet. In fact, it's very possible to get fat on healthy foods. And actually, the large amounts of saturated fat in the paleo diet makes it actually quite easy to gain weight. Fat contains 9 calories per gram, whereas carbohydrates and protein contain 4 grams. By eating large amounts of saturated fat, you can potentially start eating a huge calorie surplus unintentionally, which will actually lead to you gaining a lot of weight. Now, let's address each of these concerns in turn. Should you stop eating bread? Going gluten-free is one of the biggest health fads around right now, and it just so happens to go hand-in-hand hand with the paleo goal of avoiding wheat and grains. But is it necessary? A lot of people believe that bread can have a negative impact on digestion. Celiacs and gluten intolerant individuals are people who have an allergy to wheat and who really should avoid gluten. Thus, gluten-free foods appeared on our shelves and companies started promoting them. Now everyone is acting as though they need to avoid gluten. In reality, only 1% of the population suffers from celiac disease. In these individuals, gluten can cause the villi to atrophy. Villi are tiny fingers that live inside the intestines and which grab onto food as it goes past to absorb nutrients. Those with celiac disease can't eat gluten as it causes the villi to shrink away and stop working, which in turn prevents them from properly digesting and absorbing their foods. The result is that they can't benefit from the nutrition in their foods and they become malnourished. Symptoms include headaches, cramps, diarrhea, tiredness and more. Gluten sensitivity, meanwhile, causes similar symptoms but to a lesser degree. 
And what's more, it's believed that gluten sensitivity isn't actually caused by gluten, but rather by something else entirely called FODMAPs. The problem is that celiac disease and gluten sensitivity often go undiagnosed for a long time. Because the main symptoms are depression, tiredness, headaches, etc., it's often mistaken for chronic fatigue syndrome, stress, or even irritable bowel. Eventually, doctors suggest that patients try avoiding bread and they start to feel the best they've ever felt. Now, lots of us find that we feel tired, groggy and stressed a lot of the time. This leads to uh, you know, a kind of hope that we might in fact have a gluten sensitivity. If that's the case, then we should be able to avoid bread and feel better than ever. Then we avoid bread and we convince ourselves that that's the case. But you don't have a gluten sensitivity in all likelihood, and there's no evidence that bread can negatively impact on the average individual. Another concern is something called wheat belly. This is a concept that was popularised by a writer called William Davis with his book, also called Wheat Belly. In that book, he claimed that genetically modified proteins in bread, called gliadin, could act as an appetite stimulant through opioid channels. Davis claimed that gliadin was responsible for us eating up to 440 additional calories a day, suspiciously precise. He also said that starch's unique structure gave it an incredibly high GI, glycemic index. This would cause bread to release its calories into the body much more quickly, resulting in a sugar high and subsequent lipogenesis, the creation of fat cells, and lethargy. In other words, he describes bread as being the simplest of simple carbs and reacting in the body a little bit like pure sugar. But here's the good news. All of this is wrong. The starch in bread is exactly the same as in anything else. Starch only comes in two forms from plant tissues amylose and amylopectin. And bread actually has a lower GI than potatoes or rice. The stuff about gilladin is also nonsense. Gilladin only acts like an opiate in extremely high doses, higher than any human would ever eat. And research suggests that the human intestine may not absorb gilladorphin anyway. And importantly, bread is very convenient for making sandwiches and very nutritious. This is an excellent source of fibre that can improve your blood pressure and circulation, and it also contains a lot of minerals thanks to the added seeds. Eat whole grain bread, not the same thing as whole wheat, and you'll get the germ, the endosperm and bran from the bread. And this is very healthy. Sure, bread is still a relatively high GI carb, and if you eat too much of it, then you can gain weight quite easily. But there's no need to completely cut sandwiches out of your diet. It's far too complicated and far too hard to stick to, and there are no benefits. This is the perfect example of the flaw in a lot of paleo thinking. Just because bread wasn't around for cavemen doesn't mean that we can't eat it. It's healthy, it's convenient, and it's tasty. So that's the scoop on bread, and that's why you don't need to go to that extreme with your primal living. How about milk? Just like bread, milk is currently coming under a lot of flack from people who believe it's another modern food that's causing us more harm than good. The argument goes that milk makes you feel bad and that 60% of adults can't digest milk properly. This number is even lower for Asians and African Americans, where the percentage is said to be 5% and 25% respectively. Circumstantial evidence for milk being bad for us comes from the fact that no animal other than humans continues to consume milk post-childhood. In fact, other animals stop being able to digest milk at this age. It's thought that this lack of digestion leads to milk not being digested. The lactose sugars then get stored in the colon where they ferment and they produce cramps, bloating and nausea. Oh dear, we should probably stop drinking milk then, right? Nope. 
because what we've just described is lactose intolerance. Yes, a percentage of people are lactose intolerant, just as a percentage of people are celiacs. If you really have a lactose intolerance, then yes, milk will give you diarrhea and you'll learn that pretty early on. That's because at the age of two to five, your body will stop producing lactase, which is the enzyme that we use to break down lactose. But the rest of us won't stop producing that enzyme. 60% of adults can't digest milk, right? Well, sounds like a lot. But then if you recognize this includes 95% of Asians and 75% of African Americans, then you realize that most Caucasians can drink milk perfectly fine. The statistic that a lot of people don't seem to be promoting is that 90% of American adults can drink milk. If you're of Asian or African descent and you're watching this, then there's a higher chance you're lactose intolerant. However, it's also highly likely that you already know that because you get frequent diarrhea. Another concern regarding milk is that it may drain the bones of calcium. Despite containing a lot of calcium itself, it's thought that we can't digest much of that 300 milligrams per cup. Rather, milk acidifies the body pH and triggers a reaction. Calcium is then used to neutralize that pH and is expelled in urine. But here's the thing. That's probably wrong too. This theory is largely a result of some studies, including one that stated, Consumption of dairy products, particularly at age 20 years, was associated with an increased risk of hip fracture in old age. And this comes from a case control study of risk factors for hip fractures in the elderly, published by the American Journal of Epidemiology, volume 139, number 5, in 1994. But let's be real for a moment here. It would be impossible to avoid confounding variables over such a long study. These results would have been self-reported and correlation does not establish causality. There were only 209 individuals in the experimental group and they were recruited from hospitals. What's more is that all animal protein changes the blood pH in the same way that milk does. Therefore, it should have the same effect on calcium. The only difference? Well, milk contains lots of calcium, which counteracts this effect. Also, milk doesn't only provide calcium. It also provides saturated fat, protein and carbs in equal proportions, and is designed to spur growth. From an evolutionary perspective, why would something we use to grow our bones drain those same bones of calcium? Also, milk is delicious. It's necessary on cereal. You know, try it with water and see what I mean. And it's also in chocolate, tea, coffee and cheese. And these are all wonderful things. Even Mark's Daily Apple, one of the most influential blogs regarding the paleo diet and primal living, suggests that milk is healthy and good for us overall. Look, if you want to be 100% completely strict regarding your paleo diet, then you can be. Avoiding milk and bread won't hurt your body, and the former will actually help you to eat fewer simple carbs. But forget the idea that these things are bad for you, because there's just no evidence to support that. And I can't say that I envy you, because avoiding these foods is going to be a ton of hard work with very little reward. Or, to put it another way, most of the world's top athletes and thinkers consumed both bread and milk. Somehow, neither Linford Christie nor Albert Einstein experienced the brain fog or low energy that naysayers are so sure they should have. Just apply a little common sense. Now here's a fun fact. The reason that Americans, Europeans and East Africans can drink milk is related to changes in the DNA that can be traced back several thousand years. Some suggest that the ability comes from farming in ancient Egypt, and it has even been described as one of the most modern examples of evolution in action. If you're not lactose intolerant, then you have evolved to drink milk. So drink it. <laughs>